Recording is on. Oh, and I only have about 30 minutes today, so. All right. But I don't have any topics, so. Well, there we go. And, and I'm interested where everybody is and what you're in, most interested in talking about sort of in this in this realm. Valencia and I have a, my mission this month is to share notes with a few people and you're one of my target people to share notes with. And I want to figure out exactly what that means between the Agora and any piece of the things that I'm doing, so. Nice, thank you so much. That seems like, I'm happy to make that a, my objective as well because it's something I wanted for very long. Yeah. Sounds great. And, and a question maybe for this group is, what does that even mean? What does it mean to share notes? Um, uh, and and I, I think that the massive wiki approach of using markdown files on a GitHub repo is my least common denominator of sharing notes, which is like, hey, if we're both pointing to and can edit a shared note on a shared volume someplace, that's shared notes, right? And, and like, what, what's above that? What's beyond that? Pete, you were going to jump in, sorry. Um, I, I love the, love the topic. Um, uh, and let me, let me bring up a kind of a separate topic, but it, I feel like it, there's a connection between them. Um, I'm, I've started playing around with Nostr and I, it, I still really like it. <laughs> mm. Um, uh, however, so it, it, there's different things to say about Nostra. And the first thing I'll say is that warning disclaimer, it's not safe yet. Uh, you have to be careful with your private keys in a way that um, uh, is not to be expected from uh, new users. Um, Boris in particular, Boris Mann, um, uh, is actually like people who would make these kind of engineering decisions and let them loose in the field, I, I can't trust. So I feel like I have, a, I, I would like to have more of a conversation with Boris. There's other, um, there's other gut feels that he has about it. Um, it's too Bitcoinish. It's too, you know, yada, yada. Anyway, um, having said that, uh, at, at the heart of it, it's a way to pass messages uh, to people. For, you know, it's not peer to peer. It's actually through relays. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit like um, secure scuttlebutt, but different. But then, so I'm I'm like all excited. It's like, oh, cool. We could do maybe massive wiki uh, over over Noster. <clears throat> And then really quickly, we run into something that the TFT map people have been talking about, and Bill and I have, Bill Anderson and I have been talking about, which is massive wiki is markdown and files, but it's also sharing and versioning. Um, and you know, we've been using Git for sharing and versioning. We've tried sync thing. Uh, we've looked at PJOL. Um, uh, we've talked about, I've talked about doing it just email and attachments. And um, it turns out the versioning is is tricky um, because, so it's, it's easy to say, oh, you know, uh, um, I'll set up, uh, I'll, I'll start sending markdown files or my current version of the markdown file back and forth uh, over Nostra to somebody else. But then they've got two, you know, now they've got two copies of the same file. And then if they edit one and send it back, then we've got three copies and yada, yada, right? So um, kind of at the, it, in, in the same way we're talking about, um, uh, Matthew has finally got into Git enough to not be afraid of it or not be frustrated with it. Maybe there's a better way to say it. He was never afraid of it. <clears throat> So now he's excited about proselytizing to other people. You know, here's here's why you would use Git, and it's actually pretty useful. Um, and it made me think about um, as as I, I guess the way we we ended up realizing that most people um, most people who've been using computers for 20, 20 years or so, it's like the way you have versions of a file is. Um, you send me a Microsoft Word document, I edit it, and I send it back to you. And it's the same file because semantically it's similar to them. It's the same contract that they're working on, right? To a file system person, they've actually got multiple copies of a file that's related to, you know, but it's, you know, it's not the same file. Um, so then 
the newer thing to do is with SharePoint or Google Docs or Hedge Doc, let's all work on the same file and have multiple versions of it, but that file is never a different file. Unlike the, you know, uh, rev revision three, you know, copy two of Pete's edit of Martha's document, right? Um, so that that version thing is super important. So maybe to get back to your question, Jerry, the um, uh, there's a big conceptual leap, um, which is working on one file that has versions instead of versions of the same file that are actually separate files. Um, absolutely, totally agree. Um, and conceptually, I always lean toward, hey, let's keep a canonical version of the file out there and let's save every change to it. And even better if there's WYSIWYG concurrent editing, <clears throat> which we get with some fancy tools, uh, that, that just simplifies everybody's lives. Um, and if the file happens to be fragmented and charted and distributed in an interesting way, that's fabulous too because that changes the underlying thing, but not at the not at the cost of the mental freight of, oh, fuck, there's like 300 versions of this file out there now. And, and this is one of the things that dismays me or that I don't quite grok about FedWiki, which, mm -hmm. is that, which is that it is, uh, what's the word, promiscuous about page replication. <clears throat> uh, the moment you touch a page, it makes a copy into your FedWiki. And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't really want a copy in my FedWiki. I, I want the copy to live out where it was. And if it goes away, I want to figure out how to fix that. But I don't want copies. I don't want pages uh, profligate page replication. To me, that is crazy making. But that's just the way my brain works. It doesn't mean that practically that isn't a good solution because super distribution is sometimes uh, a fix for like broken central systems. It's uh, the, the the FedWiki thing. It reminds me. So now that I'm jumping into to Noster um, and having read and thought a little bit about Noster versus SSB, um, SSB. I, I forget the way somebody said it, but um, but SSB is really biased towards permission to 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 listen. I think or or ability to listen or something like that. SSB, you you bias towards not listening to people um, and not seeing messages. And if you want to make a connection with somebody, then you know then then you can start to see their stuff. Um, uh, SSB is secure scuttlebutt. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so then Nostra is is a little bit opposite. They kind of biased towards you have permission to speak, but no, nobody's necessarily going to listen to you. <laughs> so. FedWiki is kind of it's it's the same kind of opposite solution for you know instead of um, it 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 optimizes for everybody has a copy kind of even if all they wanted to do was edit you know a character a single character they've got a copy. Um, as opposed to let's try to keep the the party together in the in the scary movie, um, you know, and everybody should be in the same place. FedWiki really likes to to split up. <laughs> so you know, I, I guess here I wanted to like uh, so this is very interesting. Thank you, uh, first Peter, for like looking into Nostro because I saw it pass by. I read a bit about it. And I wasn't convinced, I guess, uh, about some of the key decisions and the trade-offs of, like, you know, like creating this new protocol versus maybe building on some other uh, for this purpose. But this sounds very interesting, and it's an, uh, I would take from from our point of view. Um, I guess uh, I, I was wondering as as, as we spoke. Um, what, I mean, whether we should go into like you know a, a, a more complicated protocol, like it would be like Nostra or something like this necessarily now or whether i mean going back to like uh, you know like your proposal jerry of like you know marlon repositories and the massive wiki proposal which is essentially like you know, this as well i guess it's unclear to me at this point what uh, we will gain from for example like Noster or other protocol on top of that the um 
the the reason I bring up Nostr um, is because it's really top of mind for me, and I'm I'm actually really excited about it. I've been you know thinking for a year. Oh, if there were only a way to do messaging, you know, that you could where you could follow a person, Nostr is is pretty much it, and it gets it gets a lot of things right that I hadn't guessed that you'd want. Um, so the um, PKI identity works really well. Um, uh, it is scary as heck the way that they kind of like. The, I'm, I'm getting a little bit off track. I'm not answering your question. Um, I'm excited about Nostra. I'd like to talk about it more. Yeah. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Flancing, if you'd love, like to talk offline, that would be great. Or yeah, in this I will go that. I, I visited our like a uh, uh, matter mode for like a, a bit, and then I, I context switch, and I haven't gone back. I have, really have to be better. <laughs> that. Apologies. The uh, the thing <clears throat> the thing where I was trying to answer your question and got sidetracked. Um, the uh the really the it, and it made me think of it like right away because it's like oh wow now i've got this cool message passing thing and we could pass markdown files uh you you have to decide on um a versioning strategy right. um so that was that was kind of um and you know and and there's and there's obvious choices git is an obvious choice um crdt is an obvious choice you know um I, I don't know. Sync, sync thing is probably CRDT ish. I don't know. Uh, but so so then I was I was thinking about it. It's like okay, so if I want to do a Markdown Wiki on Noster and need versioning, it's like as soon as you this this is also happening in my head when we're trying to figure out how we explain Git to non technical people, right? Um, Bill found this great video, uh, Git for Poets, uh, which turns out to have a better name than content. Um, it's a it's an okay video. It's not great. Matthew's right. going to make uh, Matthew's working right now actually on a video that that we think will be better. Mm -hmm. But but anyway, it's like as as soon as you as I think as soon as you start thinking about the version problem. Um, it's it's tempting to go well we could design something that's not as complicated as git to use um, or we could design something as that's not as complicated as crdt to implement and i think that's a a false yeah hope <laughs> it's really? like you know git works git git is i mean they the git folks get the, the linux kernel folks uh, spent a lot of time on getting git the thing that they haven't done with Git is is to make it like friendly for people who aren't programmers. But the way um, the way that you it it's built for taking turns with text lines, you know, mm -hmm. and it's built to set it up so that um, you push the conflict resolution into the right places of the collaboration team. Um, you know, I have to make I have to resolve conflicts on my my stuff before I can kind of put it back into the into the main branch, right? And, and it just does it the right way. And so I think you come up with something, but it's it's going to end up being Git or it's going to end up being CRDT. I think you know actually Pjewel I think is probably a little bit better than than Git. Um, so maybe it's maybe the thing to there's a thing called Pjewel. Um, PGO? I'll I'll type it in oh, uh, one forty five. Thank you. Um, it's no. it's actually a little bit better. It's it's um it's a little bit more like a CRDT than than Git is or something like that. So it is mm -hmm. actually better. Um, but so so then so you have to do versioning, and then pretty soon you're into like figuring out how to do Git. So, so I, I wanted to like just like bring up that I, I, I guess I personally I could interpret the versioning problem in two different ways, and I wonder which one is the one we are tackling here uh, in particular, or if it is both. There's the uh, storage like uh, versioning. Uh, so, you know, what Git actually solves, uh, for example, like for uh, once you resolve conflicts at the, some yeah, user interface level. Uh, so, essentially, how to store version data in a tree. And the other is the user interface problem, I guess, which is how do you surface the versions either when browsing, like the, the version storage, or once to core, for example. So you want to link to a particular version of something, right? 
and and the, the, the two seem um, uh, related clearly, but not the same. There's wonder, there's another are... thing too, which I so you're you're totally right. Um, I think of as as kind of like infrastructure under under the operation of Git. So another thing in Git is um, I I think of it kind of like a man trap, um, and I don't know if that's going to translate well, but. <laughs> Um, you know, and in, if you want to get into a nuclear facility, you walk or, or actually nowadays into an airport, <laughs> <laughs> um, you walk through one set of doors and the, the other, the next door is locked and then they lock the door behind you and then they inspect you and then they can let you go. Right. Git has that same kind of, um, uh, now I'm trying to think of the database uh, it has transactions, right? No, right. No. Um, basically, you're doing database transactions. You're mm -hmm. saying, I want to bundle up all of these changes together, and then I want to let them go. It's like two-phase right? commit from the old world of databases. Two-phase two right. commit, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, um, so on top of, you know, how do I keep track of all the versions? How do I navigate the versions that, um, Multiple multiple commit phase process is another part, another key part of versioning that's really hard for people to understand. But once they understand it, it goes smoothly and it makes everything easier. And Git is set up so that the places where you, um, uh, the, the places where you have to do like, uh, intelligent conflict resolution, they push it to the right part of the team. The, they push it to the people who've made the changes rather than pushing it on people who have to accept the changes, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And But then they also have, you know, like a pull request um, or merge, branch merge or something like that. It, it, it still has, you know, uh, phase commit things um, on the, the way that people, you know, merge, merge up, I guess, or merge down. Uh, Bentley? Yeah, I was just thinking and reading Matthew's post in that video, Pete. Um, and I was thinking that, you know, uh, Git has a Git lot of features that I don't think are very valuable to this use case. So, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you've even seen the option to where um, you don't have a local, I'm forgetting the term now, where you don't have to like stage your changes. So changes are automatically staged. So that takes one ever one additional kind of learning yeah. concept that most people don't need. Yeah. Um, and then it'd be nice to have something set up, which I don't know if this is a built in get, but where it's always pulling latest. Yeah. Um, so something where where someone just, and it, even something that auto commits, like so you know you're looking for values to the file, it it pushes it up even if it's in a, you know, if there's a kind of a dirty branch going on it. I think using Git as a backend is still kind of useful. Um, but I, I was just thinking about, and, you know, what are some complexities we could, that aren't serving this use case that can be yeah, shaved off. You're, you're mm -hmm. totally right. There's definitely, there's definitely a lot of advanced capability that has no utility for anybody who's not a super advanced Git user. And and you kind of want a front end to, to the the Git stuff. Yeah, and I don't think it'd be that hard to build a, yeah, an app that runs a Git instance locally and does all of that. The even the Obsidian Git plugin is it's got a you know it's got the fancy buttons um, stage and push and pull and that, but it's also got the super button which is just backup, and it does the you know. Um, it, it makes sure that you do the commit and pull in the right order before you push just magically with, with, with one button, right? Yeah, but even maybe something that doesn't have a button. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I have to say auto commits, uh, timed auto commits, there's a little bit of, I mean, it's, it's nice having time, but, but there's also, it's also nice having um, semantically important commits and, yeah. and actually groups of, you know, stages. 
Yeah, and I guess maybe there still would be nice to be have a save button. But yeah. right, so they because people understand that concept often and and have but have the save do a a push. So a, sa a concept of a save is I'm saving to the central repository for the naive and, users. And maybe I'm saving. You know, I've I've made important changes. You know, I'm doing a yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah having. Yeah, a, a way to indicate this is a this is a big and important change, you know, kind of like, you know, the way I think about it, of course, is semantic versioning, but that means nothing to the average user. But yeah, some way to say uh, labeled in Google Docs, there's labeled versions. Yeah. Um, so something similar to that. Yep. So so I I guess going back to to the original like uh, the original proposal I guess, which is you know like uh, start with Git on uh, Git on Markdown and. Or or files and Git and see how far we go. I think this this is how, everything you're saying sounds very interesting to build on top of that, right? Because, and I actually uh, started to experiment with this, but I didn't go very far. But you know, like for example, like conflict resolution for uh, wiki files, so for massive wiki files, for Aurora, you know, like nodes, uh, anything that is or see and like outliner base. Um, you know, you could imagine like essentially calling an, an auto merge like procedure for it that you know can spot the patterns that are supported for auto merge and and, and merge for the user that's eliminating you know this hard edge of like oh now we need to surface to the user somehow a way to resolve a, a you know to do, do a merge yeah um so um and and there there's also like a, a bunch of screws gonna around i guess which are like auto push and so on and yeah, you can imagine like, and they are all like they all the ones I, I I have my own, and it's crappy like all like most I think, but it works for me. But you know, I could totally imagine you know like pushing to a branch and then once a day doing like a day update or something by default yep. instead of. So and I guess here as well, like if we if we just remain on 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 Git plus maybe these are utilities, I will say my hunch is that we will have like a relatively high chance of like being able to collaborate with all the people who are storing files on Git. Which is a, a lot of people, right? Uh, yep. uh, so, yeah, and I, I guess just going shortly back as well to uh, the versioning. Uh, from I guess I asked also about the UI. It's from the point of view of the user, like the, the way I was thinking about this, and you know, of course, the question is how will you like link from one Git repo to the other at a particular version without having an API that actually you know can is aware of two repositories and, and manage that. So first, I guess you could have the API and massive wiki or the hour I could actually provide a service of trying to like do inter-git inter links. Uh, so, you know, that's one way. Uh, so, so like centralization or so on. And the other would be like time-based versioning, which is something I don't know if I mentioned, but like to some extent, you know, I, uh, I could totally imagine having like a, a format for wiki links, which says like, I want this wiki link and actually this one now. So then you, you just can say like add, add timestamp and then, you know, to some extent, you know, you see timestamps or something like this simple. Uh, you could imagine then, you know, that being on the burden of the receiving side to say, okay, what is the version that actually maps to the time to this timestamp? I have local information in the tree that lets me uh, resolve that, no? Yep. Uh, or do I say it or something? Uh, so from the UI side of things, I'm not so sure is the most critical problem to solve the, uh, I guess the, 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 the versioning one. But then maybe I'm convincing myself just because it's very hard and I, I don't know how to solve it, right? Well, I what you what you just went through is a bunch of versioning strategies. Yeah. I, they're they're kind of more user user friendly than you know than Git, and I I think that's okay um, as as long as we're kind of thoughtful about it. Um, I'm not getting echo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm happy to explore many of these. And like, for now, I'm just ignoring versions. It's like you link to something, you go to, to hell, essentially. For, yeah. for, for linking, you can kind of ignore it or, or do a timestamp thing or something like that. Mm -hmm. the, um, the thing where you have to figure out, you have to have a versioning strategy is when you're having people collaborate, you know, on what is the right. same, essentially the same file. Right. So, uh, Go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I was just thinking one other thing. I kind of noticed the difference between uh, Git and, say, like Google Docs is uh, the difference between file-based and messages. So the the if people are making conflicting changes um, because Git doesn't have a process of saying, "Oh, I made my changes here," it does kind of know the version it was on. Although I don't know if it retains that information. But you know, saying I, you know, I typed in these letters between these other letters, um, something more explicit of what the changes are would be an interesting thing. Um, and so, some of my new apps, I'm everything's message based um, as opposed to object based, um, which is what Git really is. I don't know how to incorporate that idea, but that's one of the things I'm. I'm thinking through, so it's almost like I want to layer in front of Git that's mm -hmm. message based, and then Git in the back for versioning. Right, that would be like what well, you're describing. Sounds to me like a, the CRDT approach, for example. I looked uh, at CRDT. Right, that in will bend your brain. It. I, you know, <laughs> Pete said, "Well, you can't do something simpler than CRDT." And it's like, well, I hope, I hope we can, because there, <laughs> there are some things you cannot do within that restriction mm -hmm. from my two hours of watching videos <laughs> it is uh, it is compliance yeah the crdt is is something like yeah I, a few people understand it and then the rest of us have to uh, get their libraries i mean so, it, yeah and i where is he you know yeah. yeah it creates an absolute reconcilable and i i just would like something a little bit better than git but i don't think it needs to be to that level which now i'm you know i'm disagreeing with pete's assertion from earlier but i kind of think if we get just kind of message based and it, then it it kind of take care of the of the 20 um but that uh, but like i said i don't, I don't know how to do all i, how to I think combine all I, that um, I've uh, I've been down that track a bunch of times for like 20 years, and 80% doesn't doesn't work. <laughs> well, I, but Git is 50%. I'm talking um, about taking it up to 80, as far as not versioning, but as far as uh, uh, conflict resolution. So if I can still, I mean, if yeah, I, okay, yeah, like if, yeah, like yeah. if you have yeah. human interaction, it's like oh well, these two people made these changes, but the sections overlap, what do you yeah. want to do here? And it's kind of like, oh, delete the whole thing and rewrite it. Um, I was hoping CRDT would be easy, but. <laughs> um, Pete, you have your hand up from earlier. Are you complete with I am sorry. Earlier? Actually, I never raised my hand. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, never mind. I'm uh, seeing an icon that's over your face on my display, but it means that there's one hand up, which is mine. But it looks like it's over your this over your icon. That's very weird. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I, w I was taking that as your hand being up. That's an interesting UI. Yeah, it's a UI. Oh yeah. Okay. So Pete's in the middle of my screen, like probably <laughs> like Jerry. Same here. And when the hands are up, it pops up on. Okay. Interesting. So let me jump in for a sec, since I'm the only person who had his hand up. Uh, mistakenly. And earlier in the chat, I put a whole bunch of projects that are trying to solve exactly this damn problem, uh, some of which are contemporaries and new things like the Noosphere protocol that Gordon Brander is doing, Cosmic, Paul Roney, uh, Fission, uh, and also Rich Burden with his distributed operating system, DXOS. They are all solutions to this problem, every, every blessed one of them. Some of them build on top of IPFS, some of them are doing something independent and different. And I don't have any technical chops to actually make the comparison, but I think that going to some of these state-of-the-art answers and trying to make that comparison that way might save us a little bit of time and effort and blood under our fingernails. Uh, because, because Pete, you've been butting your horns against this one for a very long time, and you're out there looking at, you know, uh, Noster and SSB and like, like, like stuff like that. So I'm trying to figure out how do we, how do we a architect simple things right now that cut through this and skip sort of like elide the problem and slide past it, which is what GitHub does for me right this moment, even though I find the reconciling of differences uh, 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 of concurrent edits atop GitHub to be abysmal. 
um, and, a, and a real hindrance, a real barrier to cooperation or collaboration. Uh, so how do we alight it? B, how do we cut through this thing so that we can then shift over to one of these func highly functioning platforms and become test pilots on it and, and go crazy using it, et cetera, et cetera. I'd be very happy to do that. And then last thought, um, I'm hoping Rich Burden can uh, show up in these calls to basically demo what it is he's built. And it, what he's doing is extremely open uh, and solves a whole bunch of these problems, including distributed identity, uh, and and a, th th there's sort of a whole set of layers of things that need to get fixed for the kinds of collaboration that we're working toward are going. And I think he's been working to try to solve a lot of them. And he has working code that's really quick and nifty. Uh, so, Sorry, was this uh, mentioned before I hopped on? Is the project public somewhere? Uh, you can. So I'll, I'll put a couple links in the chat. And we didn't talk about it very much. I mentioned, I think last time I was here that, no, I think I mentioned on the Free Jerry's Brain call that I had talked with him and had an update. Uh, and that I had invited him into either Free Jury's Brain or uh, Fellowship of the Link or both to sort of present what he's got, uh, which he's happy to do. Nice. So I will add some links right now. Oh, oh go ahead. Oh, no, you, you were the first. Uh... Yeah. Um, so I was thinking, I do think that like IPFS is probably the strongest in this space. But it doesn't actually, and I think IPFS is great too. But like, there's also, um, like, sorry I got here late, but I'm assuming we're talking about like syncing people's pages in some way across sites. Yeah. So the other thing that sort of opens up as a possibility, though apparently my work is blocking me from accessing it, but web torrents the other one. Right, and I believe WebTorrent does work with IPFS, um, and like it's a very straightforward tool that allows you to do these sort of things in browser in a way that I think would be very advantageous for what we're trying to do. Like it's very easy to imagine, hey, I click on a link, I don't have that link, I'm gonna somehow know to uh, know how to address the IPFS pin, and then download it in that moment using WebTorrent, and then sync it to uh, to my local GitHub repo with a GitHub login or something like that. Um, yeah, I believe WebTorrent is how is one of the ways PeerTube works. Um, it's like a very solid piece of work and the protocol is established. I'm pretty sure it's in all the major browsers now. So it has the advantage of being a thing that you have to download an additional thing for. Um, I think Doster is like really cool conceptually, right? The, the idea of being a truly, the truly decentralized communications approach. But I, I don't know if I can see how well it would work for something like well, for something that's not a messaging process, you know? I mean, the sort of cool idea that I like from Noster is intended to be slow, right? Which I think is very desirable for our stuff. The idea that you can queue a message at one point and send it much later and the protocol anticipates that sort of flow, right? Because it means you don't need to have an always-on server. You don't need to have always a connection to the internet. Um, and that I think is really potentially very useful, especially because so many of our projects are static sites that either aren't or don't need to be on a persistent server. I don't know, it, it would be interesting to think about how these things adhere together. I agree. So. I am I'm, I am very interested uh, in, in 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 this and in all all tools right in this in this space. I wonder if like you're going back, I guess a few threads. One is like a keep thinking of your podcast, Jerry, and how you say you know like you were you were going out for like topics and so on, and you know also going back to the tools for thought process and so on that the Boris Man was running. Uh, maybe we could imagine having like sessions call out for like you know we share about like a particular tool. And then we, you know, we could imagine having like a call out for the community saying like, hey, if you, if you like this tool or would like to learn more about this tool, 
then we meet and see, you know, how we could use this tool together as a, as a group for some purpose. Just a, it's just a pragmatic, I don't know if this, is, this makes sense. Uh, but beyond that, I guess I, I, maybe I'm stuck in the past, but I, I am still like sort of like feeling that, you know, in my mind, I guess uh, I also been working on the Avatar for two years now, uh, and I see his limitations clearly, but I sort of feel like uh, to some extent we haven't probably like maxed out opportunities of like just agreeing on a bunch of his repositories and like, you know, integrating those. Except, of course, like, like you said, uh, very rightly, whenever uh, two people really want to co collaborate real time on the same resource. But the, but the, the way I, I guess I was thinking of, uh, architecturally of that, which is what I tried like uh, doing with Hedgehog in the hour and so on, is you can uh, earmark or special case those, say this is actually for active collaboration, and then you sort of like by agreement or convention, uh, you use an intermediary tool that lets you, like CRDT base, for example, that lets you work concurrently, and then, then flashes to Git as the actual like uh, more like longer term source of truth. So this is exactly how the Hedgehog in the Agora works. Uh, you have Hedgehog, like every minute a script runs and dumps all pages to Git, and the source of truth that the Agora reads is still Git uh, and Marlon. Uh, so, you know, to some extent, I guess in my mind, it is like this, you know, like a Git repository with resources or many, and some of them we say, actually don't edit this one directly, use this proxy. That, and at that level, you can say, well, we could have like proxy tools for diagrams and visual thinking, you know, all the, essentially like we can have, like, you could imagine having like a recommended tool for thought or editing process for individual files you know, coming from the map and so on. Uh, so essentially I will take this layer approach uh, and see how far we can get with that. Uh, also considering that it's already compatible with Massive Wiki and the Agora. Um, uh, not to say that there's no like, uh, not, not a, there isn't like a better long-term approach, but this seems to be quite solid to me. Okay. Um, Pete got a bunch of us using HackMD, which is HedgeDoc. Um, and we were doing that. I I was having trouble mentally spinning up hedge uh, sort of HackMD pages and understanding where they were and when they were going anyplace. Like like the back end of it was kind of beyond my ken and was confusing yeah. me. And collaboratively editing a hedge doc was okay, but not nearly as simple and smooth as as Google Docs, uh, <clears throat> which is just so damned uh, obvious and simple, but works. And if you've got a script that's automatically doing the push, that's cool and eliminates the problem I just described. Yeah. And, and then you have then you have to sort of keep in mind that you're sort of working with interim versions of different documents as they float around a little bit. But if you can get past that and work kind of slowly and carefully, then meh, then then HedgeDoc winds up solving the concurrent writing problem. Uh, but you need to know, you need to have some way of saying, hey, there's a HedgeDoc open on this, you know, if you were about to come in and edit this page right now, there's a couple people who are off there working on HedgeDoc who've been pushing to it recently. So maybe the script would also, for example, um, as aside from pushing the occasional version to the canonical version that's living on GitHub or wherever, uh, maybe you could also put a flag on the page yeah. for anybody else coming in to edit on, you know, during the moment where people are, are collaboratively editing it, which feels like a whole bunch of workarounds and like reaching behind your back to get things done, but could solve the problem temporarily. I agree. I, I agree too, basically, yeah. I, I wanted to relate an experience that we had when we were trying sync thing. Um, uh, sync thing that would kind of like Git, except without the commit stuff. You know, it just works in the background. The funny thing that we found was that it actually syncs fast enough to be almost real time. So it's not as real time as HedgeDoc, but if you can slow down a little bit from HedgeDoc and if you're paying attention, who's who's editing, you know, who's doing most of the editing, SyncThing was actually working like a real time editor for us. So I don't know if what that tells us, but yeah, and there are like ways to speed it up too. 
uh, um, like depending on how you set up Git, if you're doing it automatically um, and not like not relying on a tool, I, I almost feel like collaborative editing. I think hedge doc is really good for collaborative editing. And I think that's a really useful thing to have on hand for stuff like this and, you know, that sort of thing. But I, I don't necessarily think it really solves the problem we're wanting to solve, which is like if we w we want separate sites that can link to and pull down from each other, mm -hmm. whether they're produced by HedgeDoc or not is not really um, useful. Yeah, that's fair. Right, and if you think about collaboration, how it works, in practice, of course, we can, for example, like the meeting notes, right? It's like we clearly like thinking right now, so it makes sense to say like, oh, we need something which is time collaborator. But like most collaboration, I think on the internet ends up have most like reading and writing process and so on, ends up being asynchronous, no? Uh, to some extent, which is why I sort of feel like we maybe we are focusing on this because it's a technical, a cool technical problem, of course, and like it does it does get us uh, something unique, but it doesn't seem like it will apply to most cases. We will need to model first, which will be more like opportunistic uh, cross linking, I think. Jerry. Then I'm just going to put a, another smelly fish on the table, which is then we also get into this question of vaults versus repos versus namespaces versus wikis versus whatever, which confuses me also and, and is, is a thorn in my side because um, partly because of the quirkiness of tools like Obsidian, which don't carry over their traits and features across vaults, but partly also because, man, what is my space? What is your space? And where did I put something? Uh, and and that needs to be really, that needs to be pretty transparent, pretty simple. Um, and the defining of boundaries around a namespace I find to be important and interesting and useful for communities of practice because when you're linking richly inside of a namespace and creating what we think of as maybe a traditional wiki, that's really powerful, and and that works really beautifully. Um, and so how to preserve that while masking or hiding the complexity of that is a companion problem to the how do I get a distributed document re, you know, a repository or a layer that does version versioning. And we've spent a whole bunch of time in Free Jury's Brain and these calls and others like kicking kicking these things around in, in different ways. Go ahead, Aram. Yeah, I'm curious how exactly does the because I've seen you do this in some of your notes, uh, Flancian. How does the push feature work in right. Agora? Yeah, so push is just like a, an experiment in like transclusion at a distance, essentially. So when you say push, you pass it like a node, which can, you can think of it as a topic or oh, no, it's a, just a weakening. And uh, then whatever is under that uh, in a scope, so for example, like indented under, so you know, that will actually show up remotely. So if you say, for example, like, uh, yeah, here I said push Nostr because I thought well, the discussion was very interesting. That means that whatever we write here will show up in the Nostr context. So it's like writing in two places at once. And how it works is it just parses for, it looks for pushes and parses them and then just they show up as uh, virtual files remotely. Not to be too pragmatic, not to be too pragmatic, but uh, how, how would I overlap my brain's links for uh, fellowship of a link calls? Uh, I've, I've got a link to the hedge doc, which has our shared notes. Right. That's done. I have a link to your Agora for the fellowship of a link uh, in my brain, but that's not really sort of the shared note right. so much. So if you have a node called uh, fellowship of a link, mm -hmm. it will show up in fellowship of a link in the Agora. So that's the, the, the basic, uh, like, you know, coordination, uh, like very basic, but you know, this, what we have as a coordination, um, I guess, uh, tool. Uh, so by, in, in essence, whenever you can name something, it will show up in those contexts. And then uh, if you, uh, you can pull or push, and in general, if you don't do it in the Agora, you won't see the effect, but the Agora will see your pulls and pushes and they, it will essentially like transclude content whenever it shows one of the resources uh, uh, or whenever you push to something in a node in the Agora. So it seems like one of the optional but good to have features here is the pulling pushing, which is the updating of the remote 
notes system with something that was just changed that is being watched or noted in the in the local system, right? And I'm I'm being very clumsy of, of, about how I'm saying that because I'm not no, sure I understand yeah. what transclusion exactly means, et cetera, et cetera. But right, right, no, no, yeah. This is this essentially, and this is an experiment. I know if it, how far it will go, but the idea is, you know, what can you write anywhere in principle, but they, in particular in any tool of thought that the algorithm can interpret and like do something useful about for you. Uh, so a pull or a push will be like a sort of some sort of like active link to put it some way, where you you're linking all giving a hint for like actually if you can do more, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you know uh, uh, pushing could be used for notifying, you know like uh, uh, you, uh, what I do sometimes. Of course, it also works in the algorithm. You have to read it there for now, but like you can take a note anywhere and say like push finish the link, and it will show up in our you know, in our mode for when we want to like, uh, you know, discuss later. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few like this. Um, and it has to do with like, sort of like uh, uh, trying to define the minimum set of uh, cooperation, uh, like uh, devices um, uh, to hint at, you know, future intention. To some mm -hmm. extent. Wanted to come back to messages versus documents because Ram said something really interesting. You know, Nostr, it's great for messages, but 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 if uh, I so my observation kind of is if you have files the size of massive wiki pages, you can just make the whole thing one message. So so you can use you can have documents but use a messaging to to transmit them i guess yeah. so then the other the other choice would be just you know here's the first version of it and then i'll send you changes via messages which is you know kind of kind of what crdt does right i think the main thing like you couldn't just set up like a network of these and have them collaborate collaboratively create a wiki through Noster or however it's pronounced by itself, there needs to be some additional layer co coordinating I, with it. Yeah, I, I think, and maybe this was before you got got on, We, I, I think of that as the versioning layer, actually. How do you manage the fact that, you know, I've got a copy of the file and you've got a copy of the file and we want to make changes in them? So yeah, I but think, then I was saying that's Git. The the solution for that is Git, basically. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think like the the other piece of the problem is like like I said, one of the advantages of Nostr from the perspective of what it's accomplishing to do is its desynchronousness. So I anticipate that because it's not prioritized speed, if we really did get a bunch of us trying to send messages to each other in order to write something collaboratively, we're going to get syncing issues yeah. or like collision issues really quickly. Yeah, Nostra isn't fast enough to do real-time editing, but right. it, it's fast enough to do async collaboration, I think, on wiki pages. Uh, yeah, but what I'm saying is like, it's even, like it's not even fast enough to guarantee that the version you're working on is necessarily the version yeah, that is the up-to-date version because yeah. it doesn't prioritize getting messages to each other quickly. It just prioritizes them getting there eventually, which is yeah. really important for what's trying to do. But for what we're trying to do, you could very easily see four of us working on a wiki. I put up a change. It syncs to um, Flancian's version, and then Jerry makes an edit, syncs that to Flancian's version, and then you make an edit to the version that I had, right? Yeah. And now there's a collision and now we have to do a merge uh, fix, yeah. um, which is, a, is gonna be a difficult thing to manage. Yeah, so there's, and there's two kinds of problem. One of those is out of orderness. It does, there's no, no desire to maintain order. Yeah, that's why I'm so hesitant to use it for this particular thing, because I think- yeah, It's totally fair. Like when we're thinking about like what the platform's prioritized, Noster is intentionally not prioritizing 
those things because it's designed. I, mean, I don't know if you like read the the story, but the guy who designed it like lives on a sailboat and only can power up Raspberry Pi to send Noster messages when he has enough sunlight, right? So like this, the protocol's not designed to uh, to be fast. It doesn't want to be fast, and I I'm always very hesitant to use systems against their design intention um because i feel like it's a good way to run into problems um yep. brief historic story which you just reminded me of which is i um i wrote about general magic in their platform magic cap and telescript way back in the day and it was fascinating because they were hot super sexy <clears throat> startup mark porat had this vision for what it was going to be uh, they were secret for a really long time. They launched and went up about 40 feet and then like plowed into the dirt like a couple feet later because they had a $400 email machine where Magic Cap, the UI, which was done by Andy Hertzfeld, who should have been famous, basically was a little prison of a desktop with no, no ability to really do anything interesting with it. I used it and I'm like, what the hell did he just build? <clears throat> it had a drawer where you could put things in a little desktop. and It was like terrible. And then Jim White, who had been part of the X400, X500 teams, was sort of trying to make up for the flaws of X400, X500 by designing Telescript, which was a message passing uh, protocol at the moment when the web suddenly gets hot. And, all, and, and it cannot emulate the web. It cannot do documents. And, I, and I'm, again, I'm out of my technical depth now. But he had basically designed a dead-end architecture of the wrong style at the moment where the opposite architecture was eating the world. And so those two reasons, plus cost, plus a bunch of other stuff, I, I think the reasons why uh, General Magic just fizzled immediately. Um, but there were brilliant designers on deck who wrote clean, like uh, greenfield uh, software uh, with the best of intentions and all of that. And, and to me, the, like th that story has really stayed with me for a long time. It's like, Ooh, just because you've got like famous, <clears throat> famous coders on on duty working hard with a with a mandate to do greenfield work doesn't mean they're going to do anything that is actually suitable to the moment. Um, sorry for the long. Time. Yeah, I mean that's like the whole story of cryptocurrency projects right there. Mm. Lots of all stars, not a lot of successful products. <laughs> yep. Um, so do we have conclusions here? Do we have experiments we want to set up? Uh, Pete, are you going to try a couple different experiments further and share back I, through a note sharing should, system? Ah. I think we should do, uh, um, uh, I think we should go down the, the markdown Git path. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm happy to stick for now with Markdown Git on GitHub, and that doesn't bleed my brain so badly that I that I need to somehow like compensate for it. Um, it it may be that the next. It may be well, yeah. I it may be that the next moves are actually kind of trying to figure out the subset of Git stuff, or making it easy enough, or you know, or something. I don't know. Cool. Uh, Aram, go ahead. Yeah, I think like it seems to me that what is needed is sort of like a, a predictable path on a site for discovery of content. And then once that's in place, like it becomes easier for us to try to do a bunch of things, right? If you have a predictable path on a site for discovery, and the second thing would be like a predictable format for the content, then, um, right? Like if if Peter wanted to try communicating with our with a site by picking it up through Noster, and I want to try IPFS, and Flansing wants to try something else entirely, right? Like that that would all work in parallel. Um, I just, like a good example of this, right, is 
for example, on on Agora, when I see a uh, a multi-word page, right? That's got uh, dashes, yeah. or or at least the ones that I'm pulling up. Mm -hmm. But when I look at uh, Peter's wiki, it's got underlines for the thing, right? So like we've mm -hmm. already moved, made it harder for the predictability problem. And then the both should work. Problem, yeah, right? Both think. should work. Okay, well that's good to know. Um, and then the second problem is how do I pull the content off, right? So much of my time is spent parsing HTML to find the actual content. So making it so that I can push, so, so that I can do the poll process. So I could, like, it would take me like 20 minutes to write a rule that says, okay, uh, whenever I go in Markdown and I double bracket, and let me see if it's on my own site and if it's not on my own site, go pull the page from somewhere else. And, for, and as long as I know what the format is, right, like I can get the appropriate content. So that's the other part of it. And it doesn't have to be like the format of the page. We could do it in JSON LD. We could have an API. I Like whatever way we want to do it, I think is fine. Um, as long as we decide on a consistent way. Like I'm fine with a lot of different ways. I just, you know, 